Amato's fifth quarter is partnered with the Inner Sanctum. The Inner Sanctum, founded in 2020, is the new ball game in sports journalism, which aims to take you behind the closed doors of sporting clubs around the country in an effort to tell the stories of those on the field. Visit The Inner Sanctum at www.theinnersanctum.com.au as well as following them on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. The Inner Sanctum. Unique interviews, unique content for you. This is Travis Dodge. This is Greg Oddie. This is Tyson Edwards. This is Brett Maher. This is Dale Kicker. This is Eugene Gregovich. This is Kevin Brooks. This is Jack Fitzpatrick. This is Dale McDonald. This is Sam Jacobs. This is Cal Brook. This is Marcus Burris. This is Sean Redditch. This is Tony Spagentine. This is Andrew Vlahov. This is Graham Corn. This is Brian Curl. This is Jason Akamanis. This is Chris McDermott. This is Mike Ellis. This is Kevin Lich. This is Matt Smith. This is Michael Brooks. This is Brendan T. And you're listening to Amato's Fifth Quarter. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Amato's Fifth Quarter. I'm your host, Dan, and episode 26 tonight here features former Gold Coast Blaze, Townsville Crocodile, and Adelaide 36er, Brendan Tees. In this episode, we go through his journey, coming through the ranks to making his first NBL appearance for the Gold Coast Blaze, who are no longer in the competition, in 2009, and the unfortunate ending of the club, uh, his two appearances for the Townsville Crocodiles, who also are no longer in the NBL, as well as his eight years as a 36er. We delve into some of the reasons for the folding of the Gold Coast Blaze. We talk about the missed opportunities at the 36ers, including the 2014 and 2018 Grand Final Series losses in, in 14 against the Wildcats and then in 18 against Melbourne United. We talk about his close relationship with Joey Wright, whom he played 235 of his 261 NBL games under Joey Wright. So pretty remarkable stat there as well as having his name forever scripted into the league's history as a club captain. Of course, he was the captain of the Adelaide 36ers for quite a few years. So from 2009 to 2021, TZ played 261 games in the NBL, amassing 987 points, 324 rebounds, 207 assists. He has played in two NBL Grand Final Series. He was the Adelaide 36ers Defensive Player of the Year in 2019-20, And as we mentioned, he was the Adelaide 36ers captain from 2018 to 2021. So we're going to get right into this chat from the Gold Coast Blaze, Townsville Crocodiles and Adelaide 36ers. It's Brendan Tees about to come onto the ground. Here in Adelaide, it was a brilliant strip from Tees. Tees! With a little party trick on the inbound. Four on one in the end, just leads a wide open lap for Brendan Tees. Welcome back to Amato's fifth quarter, and today we've got former captain of the Adelaide 36ers, Brendan Tees. Teasy, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. At this point in time, you aren't actually signed with the 36ers or, or any NBL club. Where is basketball for you at the moment? Uh, will we be seeing you on an NBL court next year at all? Still hoping. The news of Ty Webster broke today that he, he won't be playing with New Zealand this season. They already lost Corey Webster. I think there might be a spot or two uh, in Perth and... You know, there's a couple other spots around the league that I think Southeast Melbourne has, has one or two as well. So, fingers crossed I get picked up somewhere. But, yeah, I would just have to play it by ear and, and wait for that opportunity to come up. So, that means you're definitely not retired. You're definitely looking to play on. Nah, I'm definitely looking to play on, but we'll see what happens. 
So I guess just to start off, what are you doing now that basketball season's over? How have you settled into to the last few months? Yeah, look, I guess my family and I, we moved back up to Brisbane where I'm from. Me and my, me and my wife are from Brisbane, so moved back up there shortly after the season, or moved up here shortly after the season and just been up here kind of working out and getting healthy and, and all the rest of it. So just been good being around family and having a little bit of break from basketball, but also getting in the gym and working hard when I need to. So, yeah, I, I guess when I'm retired and it's all said and done, my dad owns a big uh, meat company. I've started working there two days a week in the off-season as well. You know, just only two days so I can still get out there and get on the court and get in the gym and stuff and keep working out. So I'm um, doing that right now. I'm probably, I suppose, um, when it's time to hang out the booth, I'll just, I'll just move into that role full-time as a currently working as a sustainability analyst. So try to save the world, make energy a little bit more efficient and stuff like that. So um, you'll probably find me doing that once I hang up the boot. Yeah, and I ask that question because obviously, you know, you're in your early 30s now, so you're probably closer to the end than you are at the start. Do you think it's important for, um, I guess, sporting people to have something outside of, of sport? Yeah, 100%. I think when you're an athlete, it's a good opportunity to be able to Go to, go to uni or, you know, a lot of, a lot of basketballers are lucky enough to go to college in the States before they start their professional career. But if you just went straight to professional, it's a good time to, to go to uni or pick up a course or, you know, educate yourself further. You don't necessarily have to go to uni, but somehow educate yourself so that when you're, you're finished and it's all said and done, you've got some skills to be able to go out in the workforce because, you yeah, know, when you get to a point like me and you want to keep playing, but, you know, you might not, you might not get picked up somewhere, then, I guess it can be scary times if you don't have a have a nice little fallback to go to because you, you know you, you got no skills you got no experience doing anything else other than playing basketball. So yeah, I think it's it's really important to be able to set yourself up for for post basketball or post sport definitely. Yeah, absolutely well answered. TZ, I always like to take my guests back to the start. So you, as you mentioned, you and your wife are from Brisbane originally. Mm-hmm. Could you give the listeners a bit of an insight into your life growing up, family life, parents, etc., and where and when your you, you first fell in love with the game of basketball? So I suppose I started playing when I was about seven years old, I think, six or seven years old. And my brother is actually 10 years older than me. So he, he was a jack of all trades in sport, basically. So he played a bunch of sports growing up. He was played a bit of rugby union, played a bit of cricket, played a bit of AFL, played a bit of soccer, played a bit of this and that. Like, he, you name it, he probably played it. And um, he actually picked up basketball pretty late in life. So he was pretty sure in grade 11 or 12. So he was 17, I was seven. When he started playing basketball is when I started playing basketball. And he kind of taught me all the stuff that he was learning and we'd go out and play in the backyard. And I guess that's where kind of the, the fun and the love for the game started when you're just mucking around, having fun in the backyard. And look, we would play, <laughs> we'd put the spotlights on and we'd he'd get home from school in the afternoon or whatever and we'd play, you know, from four o'clock in the afternoon up until, <laughs> you know, up until dinner time, we'd have some dinner and then we'd, Go back outside, turn the spotlights on, and keep playing outside. So into club basketball and made a bunch of friends early on playing club basketball. And yeah, I guess you, you just you go for the basketball, but then you stay for the friendship. And really, what catapulted my my love for the game and my basketball career, I guess. So this journey leads you to eventually finding a spot on the Gold Coast Blaze roster in I think two thousand nine mm-hmm. ten. Uh, under Joey Wright, who had previously won a championship with the Brisbane Bullets and um, someone you would end up spending a lot of time with. At that time, they had a, a pretty good roster. They had players like Anthony Petrie, yeah. Adam Gibson, Chris Golding, Mika yeah. Vakona. You were with the Blaze for three seasons. What are your memories from that time there? Yeah, so before that, I actually got offered a development player spot for the Brisbane Bullets. I had season tickets every year sitting in the fourth row watching the likes of CJ Bruden and Ebi Arar and all these guys who... Now I've, I've actually got the opportunity to play with and against and be coached by and stuff. And these these guys were like my idols growing up. So pretty funny that, that I ended up getting the opportunity to play with play with all those guys too. But um, yeah, nah. And Joey Joey came to like a state league game, and I would have been 17 at the time. And I had a really good game, and we 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 crossed paths a lot as I was a part of like the junior bullets program and stuff like that. So he would come to a couple of sessions and just help out he wasn't he wasn't heavily involved but we had crossed paths before um and then he came to a, a state league game and I, I had a really good game and after the game he came down and said hey would you like to be you know i can offer you a development player spot for, for the bullets and i thought that was 
an awesome opportunity and jumped to the chance and it was early pre-season like you know it was almost it was pretty much pre-pre-season so there's a few guys in town and we just get together and get a few extra guys in and have a couple of scrimmages here and there and then we got the news that um the bullets folded so i didn't actually get an opportunity to suit up for the bullets and that season um didn't have a year off because i was still heavily heavily involved playing basketball at the junior level but um, you know, I had nothing, nothing professional wise or, or college wise or anything like that. So, um, had a year off and then Joey got the job down at the Gold Coast the following season. And, you know, obviously invited me to be a develop, development player down there. And, um, you know, it's pretty hard early days because you're just a little kid and you're going in and playing against these, these men who have, like you said, there was just so many, so many guys on that team who have paved some great careers for themselves. So I was pretty starstruck that first season and didn't get to play a whole lot. I probably only played, you know, I probably only subbed in a handful of games. As you see some DPs these days, you'll, you'll sub in for the last 30 seconds of the game if you're getting blown out or if you're winning by 20 or 30 or something like that. So that first year, that was pretty much my role. But like I've said to a number of people, I see so many people these days kind of whinge and complain that they're not playing. They think they should be playing straight away. And I just took it as an opportunity to learn from, you know, basically these superstars of the league who have been around for a long time. And I just took the opportunity to learn from them. And like I said, I was still probably star starstruck by the end of the season too. So just tiptoeing around everybody being nervous. Actually, uh, a pretty funny story. I actually like wouldn't get my hair cut unless like Gibbo got his hair cut because I didn't want anyone to kind of notice or say anything to me. I just wanted to get in there, do my work and have a bit of fun and then go home. But that's how inconspicuous that was a pretty funny story. You were. That's interesting. That's how inconspicuous I was. Yeah, I was a little <laughs> timid little kid. So and then the second year, you know, I got the same sort of thing. Didn't get to play much just subbed in at the end of games and one of the guys, James Harvey, got injured halfway through the season. And so I got elevated to the roster spot while he was injured and played a little bit more that season. So played played a couple of minutes per game or whatever. Um, which was pretty exciting. That's probably where the, the fuel really started because I was like, well, hey, I can kind of, I can play with all these guys and I don't feel out of place or anything like that. And then the following year, same thing happened again. Like I was a development player, didn't play a whole lot. And then James Harvey actually got injured again. And by the end of that season, James was healthy enough to play again. And we played uh, the Wildcats in the semi final series. And James was um, healthy enough to play again, but Joey opted to stay with me to the end of that season, you know, I ended up playing like 10 minutes a game in the semi-final series against Perth, which was pretty cool to play. And then, yeah, I guess that, that kind of ended my time at the Blaze because the following year, I was probably a shoo-in to get my first actual roster spot, my first full-time contract. And that's when the Blaze actually folded. So that was a bit of a bummer to hear. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Obviously, as you said, the Gold Coast Blaze are no longer in the competition. Were you guys at all as players privy to what was happening and, and how did you personally see the folding of the Blaze? Obviously disappointing. Such a great place to play down there and, um, you know, it was a nice little fan base down there as well. So it was a little bit, a little bit of a shame that it kind of ended like that. And we, we were actually building something too. Like we had, like you said, we had a, we had a pretty decent roster and I think we, we would have been a shoo in for the playoffs for a few years to come. So that was a bit of a shame that they went under. But, like, you know, I was just a, at that time, I suppose, 19 or 20 years old, and I was just a development player. So I didn't really hear the ins and the outs like some of the older guys, some of the more experienced guys heard. So it kind of all all ended pretty abruptly for me. I just heard the news, and well, I think we, we, we got phone calls or messages or something before it got released to the media, but um, it all pretty happened pretty abruptly for me so do they when when a club folds are you as players just kind of left on your own or do, does anyone sort of help you find contract elsewhere or are you just told sorry your your position's no longer there nah, yeah at that time players association has improved so much since then and at that time there basically wasn't much of a players association so they couldn't really help us out or do much or have the power to do much to help us out so at that time yeah it was pretty much just every man for himself and quickly scrambling to find a new team pretty much yeah that's crazy but you did end up finding uh, a spot elsewhere so you had a season with the Townsville Crocodiles I know you only played yep. the, the two games there but I would imagine it would be frustrating 
getting such limited game time there in your your one and only season at Townsville? Yeah, because the frustrating thing there was, you know, obviously I contributed in the semi-final series against Perth the year before, and I thought I was, you know, due to get my my first roster spot, and then I had to basically start from scratch. And like you said, I think I played a minute and a half the whole season over a span of two games, but I really took it upon myself. Obviously, that was the first time I moved away from family as well. I was lucky enough that my now wife, who was just my girlfriend at the time, she had a cousin who lived in Townsville, so I moved in with them. But yeah, it was basically my first time away from home, so I had all the time in the world. I I would actually be the guy to get to practice early and stay the latest and book in for extra sessions in the afternoons and nights and stuff like that. But it would literally be get to training early, doing individuals, train, doing individuals after, lift weights. And then I was working at the like the cinemas up there from all right. 4 till 10 p.m. at night, get home and do it all again the next morning. But I really grinded that season and, yeah, I put in my work. I put in a lot of work that season. To, just because I wasn't playing, I knew I wasn't playing, so I could... I could really wreck myself because I didn't have to be ready to play games. I could just show up to the games exhausted from the week that I had because it was no big deal, yeah. That's such an underrated thing that not a lot of people, unless you are a professional athlete, like we don't really think that much when a player has to go interstate to, to make a career. Yeah. What's your What would your advice be to somebody who, say, gets drafted to a, a club in another state? How to... I guess, make something of yourself when you've got no friends, no family around the place? Oh, that's a good question. It's a hard one. My experience, you just got to do the right things by your teammates to start with. Try to get involved with the stuff that they're doing. And, you know, it only takes a few weeks till you work out. Like that was, what makes it easy is most of the teams that I've been involved with, everyone's been good friends. Or at least most people have been good friends with each other. You know what I mean? So when I was in Townsville, if I wasn't working straight after practice or whatever, I'd go hang out with, you know, the Mitch Norns and the Todd Blanchfields and the, the Ben Allens, all those guys, the Chris Eaters. Makes it um, easier. All those guys who, who were kind of my age or around my age at the time. Um, we'd just go and hang out afterwards. And it makes it a lot easier because you just, it gets your mind off things. And then, like I said, I had a girlfriend at the time and, and my family was in Brisbane, so... They, they would book trips and you'd be excited for, you know, like, oh, my family's coming up in four weeks, so you count the other days. And that would, that would kind of keep the, keep the excitement going until they were there. And then they'd come up and you'd have a, have a nice little, not a holiday because you're still training or whatever, but nice little fresh faces for a few days. And then they'd go home and you'd count down the, uh, count down the days until the next time they came to visit. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess you just, if, if you're lucky, you've got good teammates who, who take care of you. And I think that's what the good teams do. They just take care of, of everybody and um, if you're a part of a good club with a good culture then it kind of takes care of itself I suppose yeah it's a good answer how did the the Adelaide 36ers come about pretty much just Joey got the job and from the time I spent with him on the Gold Coast he, he knew what I could do even though I, I obviously didn't get a whole lot of court time or whatever but he'd see me day in and day out of practice and knew what I was capable of knew I would have been good good fit for the culture and all the rest of it so um, he was on the phone to me and called me up and Welcome me down to Adelaide, pretty much. In your entire career to date, you've played 261 NBL games. 235 of them have been under Joey Wright. He was mm-hmm. seemingly a massive person in your basketball career. Can you describe your relationship with Joey, the impact he has had on your career? Yeah, um, obviously he's been a huge part of my career and has taught me a lot of things along the way that uh, as a junior coming into a professional program, you don't really know the ins and outs and how things work but he was you know truly a guy to, to teach me a lot about basketball but a lot about life as well so yeah I, I, I owe a lot of credit to Joey because as far as my basketball career goes he's definitely probably the the leading voice in part of all of that and you know by the end of it it was pretty like we would literally on the court I'd look over at him or he'd yell out to me on the court like hey TZ and then we'd look at each other and we wouldn't, have, wouldn't even have to say anything he just you know, make a face or point somewhere or pretty much sign language by the end of my career because we both knew exactly what each other were thinking, which is pretty nice with the coach where you, you kind of under, understand each other like that. And obviously, I was blessed to be captain for the team. It was pretty, you know, they were, they were pretty good years just because I knew what he wanted from the team and he knew what 
you know, I went from the team and we kind of had a mutual understanding that things should be done the way that things were done, pretty much. All right, everyone. It's time for a quick quarter time break here on A5Q. Recently, I've become an ambassador of Pete and Pedro, the kings of men's hair and beard grooming. The days of the caveman are now over, gentlemen. We all need to keep on top of our hygiene, cleanliness, and style too. Unfortunately, most chemist store products do not achieve this efficiently. So if you want high quality results, you're going to have to go for high quality products. Pete and Pedro, established in 2013, offers premium hair, beard, and grooming products and tools for any well-groomed man. These products are actually going to get in there, moisturize, rehydrate, and clean your scalp, hair, and beard thoroughly without putting a hole in your wallet. From shampoos and conditioners to hair gels and putties, beard oils, brushes, combs, and even nail clippers, Pete and Pedro has it all. Now, I would never promote a brand I did not use or trust. Guys, I've been using Pete and Pedro products for the past two years and can confidently say there are no better hair and beard products on the market. Gentlemen, if you are looking to take your hair game to that next level without breaking the bank, you've got to check out Pete and Pedro. And if you use my special discount code, DAMATO10, spelled D-A-M-A-T-O-1-0, you're going to get 10% off your purchase for a limited time only, so get in quick. The link to Pete and Pedro is down in the description below. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get back to the show. One thing I've been really keen to talk to you about is season 2013-14, which in my opinion is one of the great underrated and unheralded underdog stories because the 36 is finished near the bottom the previous year under Marty Clark and then yeah. jo- Joey Wright comes in and instantly the club is successful. So back then it was yourself, Mitch Creek, Daniel Johnson, uh, Gary Irvin, former league MVP, Luke Shencher, Adam Gibson. Um, so these names, well, m- some of them back then probably weren't as heralded as what they are now but you finished yeah. second that year and you made your way to the grand final series now against the Perth Wildcats so you know, Damian Martin Sean Redditch James Ennis Jermaine Bill these sort of players were in their prime yeah. the 36ers were certainly not expected to to win that series but I think you guys put up a hell of a fight and to take it to the third game and almost clinch that championship was a remarkable effort but for the Perth Wildcats it's 20 20- Straight years in the playoffs, and now a Super Six NBL title. The Red Army is in party mode. The final score: the Perth Wildcats 93, the 36 is 59. Just one more thing to do to present the NBL Championship trophy. Yeah, look, I think that was just one of those teams that you put together and. A lot of credit, I suppose, that year goes towards the Adam Gibsons and the Anthony Petries, who, who are just tremendous people and tremendous leaders and, and tremendous teammates. Um, and they kind of have the ability to pull everyone along in the same direction because at the end of the day, especially those two guys, they don't, they don't care about anything other than winning. They didn't care if they got benched. They accept it. They didn't care if they weren't getting shots. They just accept it as long as the team was doing the right thing and the team was winning. So... When you have enough people on your team who lead the way that especially those two guys lead, and they're and you know they're they're a couple of your best players as well, then nobody else has an opportunity to go against the grain, I suppose, because these two guys epitomise they're, they're the best players on the team, and they're doing things the right way. So all you can do is look at them and say, "Hey, I'm going to do exactly the same as you guys." And I think that year was truly just because of the the, the good group of guys that we had together. And the culture that we built that year that Joey brought into the team. You know, another guy as well, Reese Carter came in halfway through the year. He was a NBL veteran. He was he was of the same mind frame by that, by that stage of his career. He just didn't care about anything other than winning. So I think he just had a bunch of guys who were really good dudes and didn't care about anything but winning. Yeah, that just kind of catapulted us to, to the grand final. And that was a hell of a run too. We, we, we went on a big win streak that year, I believe, too which is fun. And it's just all, most of the memories are off court more than on court. Um, just all the dudes hanging out together and having fun. So yeah, that was, that was a really good year. Do you ever dare to dream in, in those times when, say before like the last game of the grand final series, that you had this journey where you'd sort of weren't getting a lot of game time. You, you found yourself not getting a contract. It didn't work out at the Blaze, didn't work out at the Crocodiles. And now you're here at the 36ers and you're just one game away from winning a championship. 
do you ever think ahead or do you have to stay very much in the moment? Uh, I mean, you do. It's hard not to. You always just think about, oh, this would be cool if we won a championship. And the first half of that season, too, I didn't I didn't play a whole lot. And then our import went home and they brought Reese Carter and I all of a sudden got elevated to the starting lineup. And I was probably one of our highest points per game players in the, in the grand final series and all the rest of it. So I was a pretty huge contributor that year. So that was all, all a bit of fun. But, you know, I was still a rookie. And so I, I was excuse my friends but I was shitting my pants every game so when it came to grand final time and everyone else got a little bit more nervous I was already nervous I could be every single game that season so I was used to, I was used to it which just probably probably helped my performance in that series too the the 36s were always building it felt like every year you were building so probably a season that 36s supporters remember most for Jerome Randall who took the competition by storm and won the league MVP. You had a 17-11 record, but the the playoffs, you lose to Illawarra Hawks in the semi-final series. You win game one, but lose the next two. When you look at the history books of the NBL, it's very, very rare for the uh, the minor premier to not make the grand final series. What what do you think happened in that series to lose to fourth place? Look, I think Illawarra were very well coached under Bevo, and... I think that season two, they had a bunch of guys who were just ready to get stuck in and do the dirty work. I know that there was a few, there was a little bit of war of words after game one or heading into that series or something like that that kind of irked Illawarra the wrong way and they came out and weren't afraid to, to really get stuck into us and um, really take it to us. And all credit to them because they deserve to win that series. They, they, just, they just wanted them more than us, I suppose. And really knew I think Bevo kinda kinda knew how to play against us and they went out there and executed and yeah, I mean they weren't a terrible team either. They had a few I think they had Rotney that year too, who was a did he win the M V P one year? I don't know if he won the M V P if he didn't he was close. So they they had a lot of firepower in that game, uh, in that team and, and a lot of guys who were willing to do the dirty work as well. So it was Pretty well put together team and all credit to them that year. I just think they, they outplayed us. And that, that, you know, as plain as that. Referee says, fellas, take a break. It's half time. Hey, everyone. I just want to say a very big thank you to those who have engaged with A5Q. I really do appreciate all the support. I trust you're enjoying delving into all things Australian sport and hopefully you will continue to stick around. It would be a massive help if you could please do me a solid. Subscribe to the podcast and hit me up with a rating and a review. Gaining as much positive feedback as possible helps boost my visibility and it allows the podcast to be seen by other Australian sports tragics out there. Now, enough of that. Let's get back into it because the second half of A5Q is about to get underway. So you you didn't make the grand final that year but then the next year it, it felt externally like it was championship or bust because you brought in Josh Childress Shannon Shorter Ramon Moore yeah. and you finished second behind that incredible Melbourne United team yep. I know you, you finished one position below you finished second but you were actually statistically better that season with an 18-10 record firstly that was the year that you became the captain of the 36ers how did that come yep. about and what does it mean to you to have your name forever in history books at the Adelaide 36ers as a club captain Man, answer your second question. It's just unbelievable for me. You know, all throughout my junior career, I was captain of, you know, my rep teams and my state teams and stuff like that. And ever since starting in Adelaide, I knew it was something, you know, an achievement that I wanted to, to tick off. And I finally got that opportunity that year. And man, what a year to, to have to lead a team. We had guys who made $100 million in their career and guys who were making $50,000 a season. And to try to make everybody go in the same direction and, want to win a championship and not have ulterior motives I suppose was a huge challenge but like I said before that was just especially bringing Josh in he was such a true professional that it kind of if not our one of our better players he was our best player probably and he came in and he was so selfless he was willing to come off the bench the first few games that he came in and I don't think he'd find superstars like that around the league who'd be happy to come off the bench like he was until we needed him to start but I think he really came in and, and made everybody realize, like, oh, okay, well, you know, he's here to win. He's not here to, to get his paycheck and leave or to boost his credentials or anything like that. So I think everyone kind of followed him 
his lead that season and we all became unselfish and he did everything yeah, he could for the club. He yeah, could. he did everything he could. He definitely did everything he could. And unfortunately, that year, things didn't go away in the grand final. And he went, he was injured in, the, in game two. And I reckon, I mean, it's easy to say now, but I reckon if he was healthy for the whole series, we would have probably won that won that championship. But unfortunately, he went down. Then Sobs got ejected in game three. And that was, a, that was a tight game too. And I thought that was the one that we were going to steal. We couldn't quite get over the hump. But as talented as we were, Melbourne was... You know, equally as talented, and we had to we had to play some perfect games. Obviously, they had home court advantage, so we had to go steal one from them in Melbourne, and we just couldn't get over the line, unfortunately. But yeah, I think that was definitely the year for us to win, and we couldn't quite get over the line. So, just before we talk about the grand final series against Melbourne, uh, I just want to quickly touch on that amazing semi final game against Perth to get into the grand final. So, you were eighteen points down, and deep in the last quarter, you you snatch it and win it by one point. Well, I'd assume that game is one you remember very fondly because to beat the Wildcats in Perth in a final is very, very tough. So that was just an unbelievable game. What are your memories from that one? Well, Perth needs a rebound or get it in quick. They'll call a timeout, you think. Childress, he sorts, and a rebound for Adelaide. Ball comes down. Sixes are off to the grand final. Goodness. What a comeback from Adelaide. 18 points down. And they'll head to the grand final series, hoping to end a 16-year drought of championships. Josh Childress, a superstar in this competition with 25 points, 10 rebounds, came to play in game one and two. The Perth Wildcats just couldn't hold on for Adelaide. They're off to the big dance. They're going to take on Melbourne United. The two best teams in the competition at the regular season will go at it in a five-game series. That was amazing, especially coming from that far down. In such a hostile environment like Perth in the playoffs, you know, that's one of the memories that I remember forever. And, yeah, like you said, it was, it was to come back and it was such a cliffhanger at the end and to, to finally get over the edge because you, know, you, you want to try to get rid of Perth in as little games as possible. If you give them a sniff to, to get into a grand final, they'll take it from you. So to go over there and steal a game over there and ultimately make it to the grand final instead of them is, yes, very special. Very special and, and something that I remember forever. So the grand final series, uh, certainly one of the greatest series the NBL has seen, especially in the 2000s era. Coached by Dean Vickerman, Melbourne United were a, a fantastic club, as you mentioned. Chris Golding, Casper Ware, David Barlow, uh, Casey Prather, Ty Wesley. The series goes all the way to five games. It just seemed, and I watched the um, the replay in prep for this interview, it just seemed the last game, the 36ers, you just ran out of gas a little bit. And probably in the, the important moments, Melbourne were just a little bit cleaner when it mattered the most. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on why you, you just couldn't get it done? He looks at the clock, and United, they stand. This Melbourne franchise gets its first championship. A delightful Easter dozen. Yeah, like I said, Josh Frank went down in game two, and he was such a vital piece of that championship run. Yeah, like you said, Melbourne just executed. They just, I don't know, they were, they were really special, that final series. Throughout the year, they had some great games and they had some poor games, but that grand final series, they were truly on song and you couldn't sleep for half a second on defense or they'd, you know, they'd knock a three ball down in front of your face. So, um, you just had to be on song with everything. Your communication had to be on song. Your defense had to be on song. Your offense had to be on song. Just everything had to be perfect in order to beat those guys. And yeah, game five just we kind of went to sleep a little bit too much, and they got rolling. And yeah, the rest is history. If you if you let any one of those guys get rolling, let alone a couple of them, you're in a lot of trouble. So yeah, like I said before, they they deserve to to win that game and ultimately win win the playoffs. But yeah, I'm, it's just disappointing because so many things didn't go our way, and that was really the year for us to win it. I thought we we could go all the way that year and win it. So, yeah, a little bit disappointing, but we don't make excuses and it is what it is and Melbourne at the end of the day deserve to win that trophy. So you've played in two losing grand final series in your career. I'm sure you, you look at them both with, with that disappointment that you, you haven't 
still haven't won a championship ring. But is there one that you look at 13, 14, 17, 18 with a little bit more like that was the year we really should have done it? Oh, that's a good question. I guess firstly, I'll just address that I'm probably very lucky to play two grand final series in my career. Yeah, I didn't win a championship, but there's a lot of people who don't get to play in a grand final series, let alone win a championship. So I'm very grateful that I got that opportunity. I think if you look back at it, like just the talent that we had on that 2018 grand final series, so we're, we're probably, in my opinion, one of the best teams put together in, in the decade, talent-wise. So no, I, to, agree to, lose that. That grand, to lose that grand final series, that hurt a little bit because... I think just the, the team that we had and and the guys that we had and the camaraderie that we had that year as well, it was just disappointing to, to not finish it off with the championship, I suppose, because that would have been just the, the cherry on top of the cake. So going back to when Joey Wright first signed as coach, you guys were able to keep that same team for a lot of those years. You see the NBL rosters a lot these days. They are turned over quite a bit, but a lot of that those players stayed for that sustained time. Are yep. you disappointed that you that group didn't achieve the ultimate glory? You don't have that championship to sort of signify that that team? Yeah, I, yeah, it's disappointing. You know, those guys that I played with, that core group, I'll probably be lucky enough to call friends for the rest of my, rest of my life and we often keep in touch and uh, we all have really good relationships just because of the, the battles that we had and the camaraderie that we had off the court and all the rest of it. So, yeah, definitely. Um, you you kind of want, although we do have have a bond that we'll share for, sorry, that we'll share forever. It would have been nice to to add a championship to that bond as well. So, unfortunately, we didn't get that done. But that's that's life as a professional athlete, and that's just the way it goes sometimes. But I'm I'm very fortunate we got to play a couple of grand finals with each other. Yeah, absolutely. So after the grand final loss, it's naturally expected that you go one step higher the next year. And the 36ers, as we've mentioned, have got gradually better and better each season. But the year after 2018-19, you you went 14-14, you missed the finals. And then the following season, uh, you missed the finals again. It seemed that a few things went wrong after that grand final series loss. How do you look at those two seasons uh, 18, 19, and then 19, 20? Look, I think maybe success kind of... It's hard to it's hard to keep a, a championship team together because you win a championship and then other teams come, you know, come chasing for you or other opportunities come chasing because of your success. People want you a part of their team. So first and foremost, I suppose it's hard to, hard to keep a core cool group of guys together after they win a championship. And then also it's hard once you've had that success to, you know, kind of sustain it. It's hard to come together and win a championship because you've got to sacrifice so much and you have to, yeah, I guess it just comes back to sacrifice. You have to sacrifice so much. You have to work so hard. You put so many blood, sweat and tears into it that it's hard to sustain that for a long period of time. So I think it was just guys were just wanting it so bad the season before there was just kind of a let down that following season just because we exhausted all of our energy, I suppose, all of our energy and our, our will to win from the season before. And that's, that's only a hindsight thing. As you're going through it, you're, you're still trying to work your eyes off and you're still doing all the right things, trying to win games. But you just need everything to click to, to be successful and to have a championship run. And um, I think it was just, yeah, I, I guess a bit of fatigue from the season before just because we, we did all the right things in order to win. I think it was just fatigue that kind of got the better of us that year, I suppose, or those, those next couple of years. Do you think that, because that, that's a really, really good answer. Do you think Joey Wright had exhausted all he could as a coach that year because, or the, after the championship loss? Because obviously he departed the club and it's sort of well documented that it was not a clean departure. In, in fact, it was quite ugly. Do you think that he'd probably had enough after that? Probably, yeah. I mean, it's just hard to to have to come in and motivate people every day. To win a championship, you just need to get a good group of guys together who are super talented and skilled, who seriously would do anything to win. Like, I've probably only had a few seasons where it's all come together 
nicely in a nice little package with a nice little bow on top where we were talented, everyone was cool with each other, the culture was great, nobody cared who got all the glory, no one cared who was on the front page of the newspaper. All we wanted to do was win games and we would do anything to win games. And when you have a team that's put together and you don't tick all of those boxes, and you're trying to motivate people to, to do the right things and to sacrifice and all the rest of it, if you have to constantly try to motivate people to to do that, it would definitely be draining. You can imagine how draining that would be. And, you know, even as captain, there were some, some teams that I was on that it was just draining trying to get guys to conform to the culture or to conform to the way that the Adelaide 36ers do things because some people just don't listen and some people, you know, just want to play a season, get paid and, and go on to the next job or whatever. So it's just hard to, to find teams that are truly in it and every single part of that team is member of that team is truly in it to win a championship, basically, I suppose. So is it fair to say that some of the prerogatives weren't aligned after 17-18? I mean, look, that's just sport. I think it's very rare that uh, all the prerogatives are just to win a championship, um, especially in this day and age when, you know, we've got so many young guys from Australia going to the NBA or so much exposure to the NBA or so much so much exposure to Europe and, and EuroLeague and Asia in China and Japan. They're, they're, they're paying a lot of money over there too. So I think just the exposure that the league has now and the exposure that social media plays a part in everything and guys want to be on the on the NBA highlight tape on the, in the top 10 plays of the league come Monday morning. And not everybody can, can do that if you want to win games. You know what I'm saying? So... It's just hard to find a team to, to come together. And, and these days, just because of the exposure the NBL has and the, the exposure um, the players have to social media and they're reading things and all the rest of it, it's just hard for everyone to, to sacrifice to win a championship. We all want to get paid. We all want to, like I said, be on the front page, page of the newspaper every week and in, in the NBL highlights and all the rest of it. So it's just, it's just very hard to, to have 10 or 11 guys, whatever it is, on your team or wanting to win a championship and not caring who gets the glory. Before we get into the final stretch of this incredible chat, we need to take a final break for three-quarter time here on A5Q. Now, as I'm sure you're all aware, I love podcasting. It really is an enjoyable ride and a chance for me to share my passion to the world. So why don't you do the same? Whether it be a sports podcast like mine, a comedy podcast, an educational podcast, a movie, TV show or gaming podcast... Or even if you just want to get a few friends together for a weekly chat, it doesn't matter what your podcast is about. What matters is setting it up through Podbean. Podbean is the best and most certainly the easiest way to start a podcast. And the best part of it is it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. If you hit up my special link at www.podbean.com slash A5Q, you'll have the choice of starting your brand new podcast for as little as $9 per month on an annual plan. Now that is an unbelievable price considering you'll get unlimited storage, beautiful podcast themes, you'll be able to map your own domain, comprehensive podcast stats and podcast monetization. Now guys, I tried to set up my podcast with a few other websites and just couldn't work it out. It was way too complicated but Podbean was just so simple, so easy to use and it produced the results for me. So definitely if you've been thinking about starting your own podcast but you've got no idea how to go about it, Visit www.podbean.com slash A5Q and get started with Podbean today to join the Pod family. Or if it's easier, the link will be in the description below. But in the meantime, let's get back to the show. I mean, I've had Kevin Brooks on the show and, and he went into this a little bit. I mean, if you're okay to talk about it, could you maybe give us a bit of an insight into sort of the ending of Joey Wright's time at the club? I know it wasn't a good time, but... What was your view on that situation as a captain? Yeah, it was disappointing. Like I said, Joey is a huge part of my basketball career and I owe, I owe a lot of credit towards him. So it was sad to see him go. But, you know, being a part of so many great teams and then having a couple of teams who who didn't have it all together, it just would have been so frustrating for him. And I think it was probably good for him to, to get out the time that he did because you just see it was, it was draining, him, draining his energy and... and taking a toll on him um, and his health, I think, too. So it's disappointing to see him go because I've got a lot, a lot of love for that man. But it is what it is, and I think he, he got out at the right time. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. 
Teasy, just as we are about to close up, I just want to quickly chat about the season that's just gone by. For the club, obviously, wasn't the best season. You missed the finals for, for the third year in a row under Connor Henry, who was no longer with the club. But um, it's going to be the most fondly remembered for playing with Josh Giddy. So um, under the Next Stars yep. program, he won the club's MVP and also took out the league rookie of the year, been drafted by OKC. With the sixth pick in the 2021 NBA Draft, the Oklahoma City Thunder select Josh Giddy from Ooh. Melbourne, Australia, and the okay. NBA Global Academy wow. in Canberra, Australia. So Josh Giddy is the fifth Australian-born player drafted in the lottery, the first since Ben Simmons in 2016. As you heard Commissioner Silver mention, he attended the Global Academy in Australia in 2019 and 20, won the NBA Rookie of the Year for the 36ers. Well, firstly, what was it like to share a locker room with, with Josh Giddy, and how do you think he's going to fare playing over there in the NBA? Giddy's a really good kid. I have a few NBA scouts, obviously, call me and ask me about him as a person and, and as a player. And although there's, there's some things he has to mature with, which you got to remember, he's still an 18-year-old kid. And as an 18-year-old kid, to, to do the things that he does is just amazing to me. He's, he's legit six foot eight. He's a good kid, speaks very well. Great demeanor, his basketball IQ and his ability to, to read the game, his awareness and his ability to read the game are, uh, you know, second to none. I think he, he's, he's great at that stuff. And then the stuff that he's got to mature on in terms of, I suppose, his point guard skills in terms of trying to lead a team and being able to tell, you know, whoever he's playing with down the track, being able to tell, like, Kevin Durant, hey man, like I need you to get in this spot and come off the screen and I'll get you the ball here or whatever. You probably have to develop that ability to be able to tell people where to go, but that comes along with age and experience. So it's pretty tough ask for him to do that now, but super smart, super good kid, super talented, super skilled. And I hope he does really well and I hope he has a long, prosperous NBA career because he, I think he deserves it. Awesome answer. Teasy, just as now we are about to close up, I've just got three last questions for you and I always finish off my interviews asking these three questions. In your yep. entire NBL career at any club, who is the best player you ever played with and why? Who's the best player you've played against and why? And lastly, I probably don't need to ask this, but I will anyway. Who's the best coach you ever played under and why? I'll answer your question, your first question in a two-part answer. The best player I've ever played with is Jerome Randall. The stuff he could do on court was just amazing. Just his speed and his ability to, to get by his guy or to create the shot that he wanted to create was absolutely amazing and sometimes you, you get carried away with, with watching him you get you get front row seats or you're playing alongside him so sometimes you fall asleep and you're in awe of some of the stuff that he does and obviously you guys get to see what he does in games but he also does some some crazy stuff at training too that you miss out on so definitely Jerome Randall's the best player I've played with um, the best teammate I've had the best player to play with is Anthony Petrie in my opinion he was just a guy who even at practice, he'd rip your head off in order to get a rebound or something like that. You'd get in fights with him, you'd argue with him, and you'd get off the court, and he would be the first guy to pay on the back, take you to lunch, just an ultimate competitor, but just a great human being as well, and had the ability to turn it on when he needed to and turn it off when he needed to. So he's, he's one of my favorite teammates of all time. Best player I've played again, Jerome Randall. No, I'm kidding, when he, when he played at Sydney. No, I'm kidding. An underrated guy for me to play against was probably Kevin Lish. Yeah, he was fantastic. It's always, yeah, it's always hard. When he was in his prime, it's just always hard to guard people um, who can shoot but are also really fast. And on top of that, Lish had the ability to draw fouls really well too. So he, he could just sense that you had your hands in the wrong place and he'd grab you or he'd sweep through your hands or, or something like that. So he had the ability to to shoot in your face, he had the ability to drive past you, but he could also draw fouls too. So he was dangerous all three ways. So Kevin Lish has probably had a few few tough battles against him. And then, yeah, obviously coaches and no-brainer. Joey Wright, just his knowledge of the game, first and foremost, he just reads the game really well. I think for the most part, he he understands people and how to get the best out of out of his players. He gets it wrong sometimes because we're all human, but for the most part, understands his players and, and what role they can play for the team to win. 
but then just also his competitiveness and his will to win and his desire to win and his ability to drive his players to win as well, I think is just really incredible, uh, a, a really incredible skill that he has. So yeah, that'd, that'd be my top three, three point one. TZ, it's been fantastic to chat. I really do appreciate your time. I wish you all the best in finding a contract for next season. And whenever the time does come for you to hang up the boots, I wish you all the best post-basketball. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. And that's a wrap. Thank you to everyone for tuning into A5Q. Don't forget to spread the word, subscribe, leave a rating. Until next time, old sport.